We've come to have a very interesting conversation about a yet-to-be-launched book on the 14th of June at the Ghana Academy of Arts and Sciences at 3 p.m. It's a book co-authored by Larry DiMaggio Parks, also known as Chamamao sometime, who was the leader of the Blue Group, and also Paddy Wayne, and then Danny Davis, where they are beautiful sisters, Ama, Adoma, Efua, and Antiagi. You would know them as the Ahoy brothers with their sisters. Please, put your hands together, welcome them. Good morning, how are you doing? We're fine. Yeah, we're very Congratulations busy. to you. This uh, has been long awaited, and we're happy to have it here. Uncle Ato, how are you doing? I'm doing fine. Uncle Isi? Uncle Isi, how are you? I am in good shape. Great. Very good shape. Auntie Ama? I'm fine. Oh, Kwame now. Fine. Okay. Taduma, everybody is fine. Yes. Why did, did you have to put together your autobiographies into one book? Whose idea was it? Well, you know, our, our mother died a few years ago. All right. Uh, our last born, we call her baby last. Mm. Sister Gay, mm. was wondering if we could, you know, do something to memorialize her. Mm. Um, the first suggestion was that, well, we have to put a tomb on a grave. Right. And uh, we thought that, well, the tomb is fine, we'll do it, and we have done it. Right. But people have to travel to where she was buried, which is Aguna Mankong in the Aguna East District. Right. Uh, before they will see her. But if we put a biography, a collective biography in a book, in which she is a central figure, in fact, one of the reviewers have called her the eighth author of the book. Wow. You know, then the book will sell not only nationally but internationally mm, mm. and that will be the best way of you know, uh, perpetuating her memory. Right. So that was the that idea. That was the idea. Yes. Antama, what was it like living in house number D13, South and Trestle? House number D13, South and Trestle mm. was a beautiful place. A, a small two-bedroom self-contained house okay. Okay. with a lot of children their parents live there. We, the children, lost our father very early. I was nine mm -hmm. when, when our father died. Okay. So we had to help our mom to take good care of us. Mm. She wasn't working. My daddy didn't allow her to work. So she was not working. But after the death of our father, she decided to do something small. Okay. So we helped her. Right. In those days, there was nothing like Child, child labor. Mm. So we were selling a mori, kerosene, bread, mm. pants, buffroot, donuts to help her take care of us. And that is what has brought us this far. Uncle mm. yes. okay, uh, uh, Amla, sorry. The, the school going times, I noticed that your primary school moments were very exciting. In fact, very exciting to read, easy read. But there was something striking about St. Augustine's College. Bremper College as well. But all of you wanted to troop there. What was it about Bremper College? I think was the first to go to Bremper College. Mm. 1958, right? Yes. And uh, I followed. Okay. In 1960. Please use the mic for me. Yeah, I followed in 1960. Mm. Uh, but before I got to Bremper College, I was uh, delivering. Fruit okay. to the school canteen. That's right. That's college. right. Uh, and you won't allow people to steal your bull fruit. I, I know those who attempted <laughs> to steal. They are very well to do dignify people today, but mm. in those days they were they were rogues. Mm. Yeah, because they were trying to put me into trouble with my mother. Mm. So that was that was it. Uh, from Pemper College, I, I, I went up to form five mm. and left for St. Augustine. Okay. But I took continued to the okay. sixth form. But, but while you were at Pemper College, yeah. You went in as a form one boy, a homo, and, and those who tried to take your bow fruit and you prevented them, homo do some more for it. Uh, <laughs> that was one reason because they attempted to steal my bow fruit. But Ato, as my senior brother and senior in the school, mm. did a lot of homoing of okay. all the people who came between mm. me and him. So when they got his brother, also in the school, they mm. decided to teach him a lesson. Mm. I see. And I must say, they, they really homoed me. Homo is a term that every Ghanaian who's mm. been to a secondary mm. school knows. Mm. The way you are handled, mishandled by the seniors by mm. way of uh, teaching you a lesson. Mm. 
Right. So I, I got a fair share of mm. this kind of treatment. Uncle Atu, the book says you were a prankster at <laughs> St. Augustine's. Uh, you know, a yeah, prempe, you were a prankster. Uh, what, what exactly did, you, did it mean then? I did all sorts of things. <laughs> were you a bad boy? I was a very bad boy. <laughs> I was. You were? Uh, I see. Every, the, every, every bad activity we took place at Prempe, mm -hmm. I was either part of it or mm -hmm. underneath it. Larry or, DiMaggio or, Parks. Or behind it. How so, did that name come about? Larry DiMaggio. Yeah. yeah. In our days, you must, you know, have you have to have a guy name. Mm. Yeah. <coughs> I selected that name. Okay. Because you like that character. Yeah, I like that oh, character. Okay. And then Paddy Wayne. Paddy Payne. Paddy Payne. Paddy Payne was a flight uh, lieutenant in okay. the army in those uh, cartoon uh, magazines. Okay. And uh, I, I wanted to be a pilot, actually. Mm. So mm. I took that name after me. I see. But one of the pranks that uh, we pulled, there was this beautiful uh, film at the uh, Rivoli Cinema. Rivoli, that. I think like to hail and back or something right. like that. So we went and pulled the uh, school, school bell, bell for a roll call to be conducted. A very unusual time and a very unusual roll call. So after the roll call had been done, a whole lot of students sneaked mm -hmm. into Rivoli Cinema mm -hmm. to go and watch this film. Whilst we were in the cinema room, mm -hmm. apparently a certain headmaster thought the bell was odd. Mm -hmm. So he went to ask the headmaster whether he ordered the bell. And the headmaster said no. Mm -hmm. Then he said he smelled a rat. So they should re toll the bell. So they did. And in the cinema hall, not far away from Prembergle, we could hear the bell tolling. Right. Jesus Christ, come and see. <laughs> Athletics. Speed. Speed. <laughs> but by the time we got to the school, a whole lot of us had been caught, mm. not being on our on beds our at that time. Right. So we were all suspended. Mm. Our oh. two were suspended. I was suspended. More than 50 students were, were, were sent on suspension. Mm. Uh, and, and we came back uh, like uh, prison graduates. Mm. If you had not been suspended in the school, mean you were not a tough guy. So, so all of them wanted to be tough guys. I see. In that Interesting. Antoine Dumont, you wanted to become a medical doctor. So you went to Wesley Girls. And then you met Sabu, the biology teacher. And then what changed? Uh, yes, I wanted to become Please a use the microphone for me. I wanted to become a doctor. Right. But... Uh, Something happened. Somebody got hurt, mm -hmm. and I saw the blood, and I said, "No, this is not for me." Okay. You know, but I enjoyed I enjoyed the science, especially the mm. biology, because Sabu, she was a terror. Who was you that? know, Sabu was our biology teacher. <laughs> <laughs> she was a terror, mm. and at the same time, very protective of the girls, and. Uh, Pampered us more or less, the mm. science students. Right. You know, if you do biology, she will take you to uh, Elmina Beach. Okay. Okay. You go and look at the sea urchins, mm. sea mm. anemones, mm. all the. Uh, he will take you to Kakum Park and all those places. Right. So we really, really enjoyed her, her, her class, mm. you know. But uh, I decided that no, uh, medicine, <laughs> medicine is not for is me. Not for you. I'll change to art subjects. Right. O level, I did nine subjects mm. because I wanted to do, but because I did nine, it, it included all the art subjects mm -hmm. too, so I could mm. change easily in this form. Interesting. A la carte, the chapel prefect. A la carte is not here. A la carte is not here. A la is not here. Oh, she's not. She's the she's one that I'm directly after. Directly after, yes. but she was the chapel prefect. Yeah. She was the chapel okay. prefect. But then again, the two teacher, trainee, teacher trainees. Um, you know, and uh, how did you end up there? Because all your others went to secondary school, I'm so how did you end up there? Right. I went to the training Oh, you, you went, okay. Originally, I wanted to be a nurse. Right. So, before I decided, this guy, we were very <coughs> close in age. Okay. And in those days, women were not given the chance to go to school. Mm. We were to be housewives. Okay. So we both passed the common entrance. Mm. My mom, who wasn't all that mm -hmm. wealthy, decided that Kwamna should go to secondary school. Okay. I should stay in the house, take care of this little baby there, <laughs> the last baby. Okay. Then when I decided to become a nurse, she, 
she said, nursing is not good for you. You know, when you become a nurse and you go on night duty, by the time you come back, somebody ha might have snatched your husband. Oh. So become a teacher. <laughs> Teachers, you have three months vacation. Mm. That would allow you to stay in the house with your children right. and be a very good mother. Mm. She, she coerced me to get into the training college. Okay. So that's how I became that's how a teacher. Became. Let's talk particularly about the Mace uh, Educational Center, you know, which you named after your mom. How's it doing these days? Progressing. Please use the microphone for me. It's still progressing. I see. Yeah. Interesting. <laughs> and how did it start? Hmm. I had always wanted to be a teacher, actually. Hmm. So when I got into the field, I was always looking at the opportunity to. But then I think uh, at the training college, I was motivated mm -hmm. by the uh, nuns who were then our tutors. The St. Louis Training College. Uh, staff was made up of uh, basically mm. the mm. Catholic nuns and they were always inspiring us too. So when I finished school, did a few of the teaching at the various places that I have done, which right. is in the, stated in the book. Right. Um, I got married mm. and I decided that I would opt out and then go into my own private work. Right as a, a proprietor mm. and uh, I had wanted to start it when I was 30 okay. but unfortunately mm. uh, I had to uh, do it when I got to 33. Mm. So it all started that uh, at, the, at the house that I was living with my husband we had a backyard and uh, I converted the backyard into two classrooms okay. and uh, the first uh, day that the school was opened, even mm. though I didn't have any advertisement done anywhere, I just wrote it on a small notice board by the wall, uh, school in progress. Right. And that very day, I had 25 children. I see. Uh -huh. How did your mom feel at the time? How did she? Yes. She was very you know that you're just starting this, named after her. She, she was surprised because I didn't even consult her. Oh, okay. Yes. So she was very surprised and at the same time she was very happy. Uh, so she took it upon herself that at the end of every month she would pluck some uh, bananas and uh, oranges at her background yard mm. and bring them to the children in the school. Ah, lovely, yeah. lovely. Sister Aguilar, let me ask you, have you found yourself in trouble because your big brothers were in politics or governance? I have not, actually because not many people knew that I was actually related to the Ahoy family. Okay. People thought, okay, maybe she knows them, because I never said it. In fact, on campus mm. in Tema Secondary School, nobody knew except right. for two friends mm. who were cl very close to me. Mm -hmm. So people had no idea, and they sometimes are quite surprised mm. when they realize that actually I'm related and I'm a sibling, mm. part of the family. Mm. And more so when my, my mom passed away and I came, it was very surprising to people. A friend of mine called me that mm. someone told her she was related to, I was related to the Ahoys. Okay. And I called her, hey, any Ahmini Pankasa? And I'm like, that's okay, all. That, that's it. Uh, but I haven't found myself in mm. any problems mm. because of my rela relationship to my siblings. You, you mentioned Tema Secondary School. Initially, you had Kumasi girls. Yes. And then your brothers vehemently said, that, no, 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 no. Go back and sit for the common entrance. W what was the mood and feeling like at the time when they insisted that go, you had to go and reset your face? I, I was like, no, I, I really want to go there, you know. And my mom went with me and then she paid the deposit, I believe. Mm -hmm. And we came home and brother said that, you know what, try again and mm -hmm. then go to a different school. I, d I didn't know at that time whether Kumasi Girls mm -hmm. wasn't the greatest school. I thought it was. Right. Yes, but I, heed, I heeded to what they said, they said. and I restarted again. 
Beautiful. Uncle Amina, let, let me come to you. The Fourth Republic, uh, before it came into being, there was a conversation in the book. Chapter 9 talks about either you build a house or you rent one or you dismantle because we're trying to transition from PNDC to NDC. How has that matter resolved? Well, um, as we have recounted in the book, <clears throat> we sent, the T PNDC sent teams around the whole country mm. to assess the likely reaction of the people to a PNDC party. Right. You know, um, and the teams came back and almost unanimously uh, concluded mm. that the PNDC was very popular, that a PNDC party would enjoy tremendous support, especially mm -hmm. if Jerry John Rollins mm -hmm. was leading that party. Now, just to explain you know, the terminology that you used, what we meant by renting a house mm -hmm. was maybe getting uh, involved or taking over one of the then existing political uh, traditions. Right. Abandoning the house meant dismantling the PNDC for mm. every individual in the PNDC system right. to find their own level in their own political parties. Mm -hmm. And then building a house meant creating our own party. Right. Now, we jettisoned the idea of renting a house because we said if you rented a house, mm. you could not do anything to the house. You have right. to take the house as it was right. and pay your rent. Right. If you, if, you, if you abandoned the house, it meant that all that we had struggled to achieve in the PNDC era would be lost <laughs> right. because then we'd be going our individual ways. But if we built a house, it meant you were starting from scratch mm. and we could innovate. We could, we could build on the ideology and the philosophy of the revolution right. and create a party that would, ref would reflect and, and, you, and you chose and that option. And we chose that option. Right. Especially because the em emissaries who went out came back to report that we stood a chance of winning. Has it paid election. off? It has paid off. Well, I should say it paid off uh, until recent phenomena and occurrences uh, making us begin to worry, you know, um, because the direction in which we are going now uh, was not the direction that we had envisaged when we created the Fourth Republic. Mm. But I don't want to go into any further detail. I, I want to hear it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, I think we will end there. You want to end there, Prof? Yes. I'm enjoying the lecture. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I, don't, I don't want to monopolize the conversation. Because if you. we start, it will be about... I'll, 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 I'll come back to you. Okay. Uncle uh, so you're credited with Ghana Trade Fair Authority, even though you sh short-lived there. GIPC, you got the act um, looked at properly. Meet me there, Sunday market. Um, you looked at foreign direct investment production and all of that. Would you also say we're on the right track? in terms of producing to consume, recent conversations about our inflation largely imported 23.6 and all of that. Well, we, we, had, we had to go on that tangent because as a country, you need to have your inflows of mm -hmm. foreign uh, resource right. uh, to build your, your, to carry on your development agenda. Mm -hmm. And at that time, at the Expo promotion, majority of the product that we're exporting, the th uh, three products were timber, gold, and uh, um, timber, Coco. gold, and cocoa. Right. So we, we had to diversify the export base. Mm -hmm. And export promotion was charged with that responsibility. And I must say, uh, we, we did very, very, very well. I mean, uh, a crack team, Teviachia and uh, Ayutu, Belayani, uh, a whole crack team was put together. And, and we, we, we charted the path. Indeed, at a point, every child in Ghana was singing the, the export promotion right, song, export right, Ghana, export right, more. Right. And not just the promotion side, but we physically took charge of developing the production base, the supply base, mm. in selected areas. We looked at the agri sector, mm -hmm. we looked at the manufacturing sector, we looked at the handicraft sector, mm. And, and picked what I would call winners in okay. all these sectors right. and give them the necessary push, mm -hmm. you know, like, like picking the winners, uh, give them the push to go. In the pineapple industry, for example, I can mention uh, 
combined farms of mm. blessed memory. The mm. owner, Safo, is gone, but the, the business still runs. His children have taken over. Mm. I can mention Koranko, Adikopa, uh, John Lawrence, mm. um, uh, so many of them, uh, about eight of them. In the in wood industry, I can mention Tobo Mensa of mm. blessed memory. Mm. He just passed recently. Right. right. Fernard, P. Wood, uh, Ashanti Furniture, Pegamon. All these companies are mentioning in the wood sector, mm. unfortunately, have virtually collapsed because the Chinese furniture industry and wood industry have mm. taken over mm. our markets. So, totally. so would you say we have lost focus in terms we of have lost focus producing? But then Ghana, government now has one district, one factory, for example. Is, is that the panacea? It, it, it could be. It could be the panacea if the direction is put right. Mm -hmm. I mean, you just can't put a factory anywhere mm -hmm. when there is no raw material base, when the demand is not there. So the demand has to be there. Everything mm -hmm. that you produce must have a market. Right. And Ghanaians typically have a taste for foreign products. Mm -hmm. We do not appreciate that which is locally ours. So you have to make a concrete effort to develop the taste of the Ghanaian so that they will buy what you are producing. Right. Otherwise, we will produce by the end of the day there will be no market for it. Interesting. Uncle Atu, I'll, I'll come to you. I, I, I wanted to come to Auntie Amar, but I'll come to you first before I go to, because rural electrification, again, conversations about doom saw, whether it is gone, whether it's there. You had a concept for rural electrification because you had gone to the U.S., seeing that even people who lived in rural U.S. had access to light, even though they couldn't pay it. And then you found your... A very good friend and protege, uh, Dr. Charles Rekubrobe, who worked closely with you in that direction. But you had a target for 2020 to make sure that the whole country was electrified or had access to electricity, I should say. We missed that target. How does that make you feel? We missed the target. It should have made me feel very sad, but I'm very happy. Why? That's strange. I'm happy that because even though we missed the target of 2020, by the time I was leaving the ministry, mm. a fairly good percentage of the country had access to electricity. Mm -hmm. And uh, later on, it became a competition among the various chiefs, and then also a competition amongst political parties. Every political party wanted to be associated with rural electrification. Right. And then, in their manifestos and campaign promises, they will say that, oh, when we will come, we'll continue the rural electrification. So it was, it's one of the few projects in this country which was not abandoned by successive governments. Mm. They continued with it, and it, it caught on very well. Mm. When, when, when we moved in and we were doing this rural electrification, we realized that we needed a, a progress timetable. So we had an electrification program whereby each and every town was slated for a particular date for which they would get electricity. Okay. And we also said that if you wanted to jump that queue, mm -hmm. then you must provide your poles. If you provide your electricity poles, mm -hmm. then we will bring you the, the what we call the electricity wire mm -hmm. and then the transformers. Okay. And this became one of the most interesting things that I've ever witnessed. Interesting. You go to a village, mm. and they want they will, the people want to destroy the chief because he hasn't brought electricity to the village. Meanwhile, a small village next door Had has got electricity, and it it, it went on very well. Mm. After that, we decided that if we are sending electricity to all these villages, right. what about the people? whose houses mm. and whose villages were overtaken by, were inundated by the lake, mm. the mm. formation of the lake. Right. Like towns like uh, Ketekrache right. and the rest. The original Ketekrache is underneath the lake. Mm. Mm. So we <coughs> had to come in with a program whereby we could give these towns also access to electricity. Okay. Now, now, the conversation about access to electricity comes, also comes with pricing. Recently, we've had the ECG go to PURC to say, uh, we want to increase the tariffs so that we can serve you better, da, 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 da. Uh, what do you say? Uh, you see, 
where, when, when you move into party politics, people want to take popular decisions. I served under a military regime where we had no time for popular decisions. We had time for practical decisions. So in those days, the problems that we are facing now were, were, were not there. Because if the PNDC decided that electricity tariff should be this, that was it. End of story. End of story. No debate. Not today. Today, today, <laughs> you go to parliament and talk and talk and talk and talk and nothing will happen. I see. You have to go to PURC, mm. who would then determine for the producer or the generator of the electricity, mm. what, at what prices you sell the electricity. Let, let's talk about CT and uh, H Limited. You know, did a lot of... No. I'm, move, I'm moving to uh, Adma. Ah. Thank you very much, Mr. Kwatso. CT and H, so many things that you were involved in, but particularly were inter interested in the distribution of books to schools, and you did that excellently. How, how do you take it now that three years on after changing curriculum for school children, they have no access to textbooks? I mean, you run an, an educational institution. How do you take it? Uh, just yesterday, I was talking to somebody, and we were saying that... You, you uh, have to speak up loudly for me. With, Thank you. With all the talk, free SHS right. and all that, right. since 2017, mm -hmm. no books have been printed. The only books that have been printed are past questions. Right for SHS students mm -hmm. and uh, even past uh, or questions for primary three people going to primary four. I know that contracts <coughs> are now being given for books to be printed for the other, other right. classes and schools. Right. We were not into printing. Some of the printers or publishers were contracting us to distribute the books for them. Mm. So. The business was, if, if you know a, a publisher, mm. then you contact the publisher okay. and then he will give you the right. contract to, right. distribute. to distribute. So you do it for one, one publisher, mm. he sees that, oh, you are good, you go, because when you send the books to the districts or to mm. the schools, there are certain things that, certain requirements, you have to fill forms, make sure everything is ready right. before you bring those That's documents right. to education before right. they are paid. That's right. And we're doing that very well. So we got a lot of the people, a lot of the publishers contacting mm. us mm. to do the distribution. Interesting. We have missed a lot because there have been no publication of books. So, so business is not as it was then? As it was then, right. since 2017. The last books that were distributed were printed in 2016 interesting you know but so, 2017 mm. that was when the books arrived and that was when we did the distribution mm. and therefore there's something striking in the book i saw about education free shs but then you also mentioned that that mantra had been had not been watered down to the grassroots so people for example walked up to may educational center thinking that well if it's free at the top, it should be free at the bottom as well. <laughs> and you had confrontations with, with parents who couldn't just understand that it's supposed to be free. Why are you being difficult? How did you deal with that situation? It has not been easy even up to now. It has not been easy even up to now. People still think that once it's education, it has to be free. But uh, God's so good, there are some people within the country who know that uh, getting things free normally doesn't end well. And so they are still uh, with the private sector. Mm. It's not just maize, but every private school, mm. every private school had a hitch. Mm. And uh, we, we form an association, so we encourage ourselves. Okay. I, for instance, am the... Um, President of the Council for Private Early Childhood. Right. And so when we meet, we discuss, and then we also look at the way forward to encourage the few that uh, 
still cope with us. Mm. We've lost a lot of our uh, students. Right. And I must say that the few that are even coming, uh, paying school fees is not as easy as it used to be. So we are we are with it. Mm. Mm. And Tama, which which of mommy's legacies are you championing to preserve properly? Auntie May's legacies. Ma's legacies. Mm. <laughs> yes, Ma. She was kind, very loving. Mm. You get to her house, whether you have eaten or not, you have to eat. Mm. And I think I'm following that legacy. Mm. You enter the house, you have to get something to eat. Wow. Loving. Mm -hmm. So I love a I love people mm. and I like people. All right. Yes, I'm following that course. God bless you. Hold. Uh, let me add something to what she said. <laughs> Our mother was a mother, motherhood, and she has ad adopted that. So we call her mother. Oh, okay. She stopped every work that she was doing to take care of, of our mother for the last three years of her life. Wow. She stayed with our mom throughout, and she, our mom died in her hands, technically. Oh. So she made that call. Exactly. After that, our sister, Adoma, mm. also had a problem, surgical problem. Ama moved to Adoma's house and stayed there with her for, and they are still there, for about a year. About a year. I will add to it also. Yes. I wasn't well at some point in yes in the US in two, 2010, mm. and she stopped everything and came and spent very quality time with me. And she nobody even told my mom that wow, I wasn't well, and she was wondering why. My sisters came because the two of them also joined mm. and she kept wondering. She, they just told her they wanted to visit me. Mm. And you were enjoying your last baby status. I was <laughs> kind of enjoying it, but right. my sister Ama has been, She's been very phenomenal. dynamic and we appreciate her. Thank you very much. Well, so yes, sir. Yes, Prof. <laughs> One major quality of her mm. was integrity. She was an honest woman and she was a woman of integrity. And that is what has affected all of us. All of you. Um, if you ask the people that we have worked with, mm. they will tell you that we are persons of integrity. Right. Uncle Ato, you wanted to say something? Yeah. Our sister Amma, when she was talking, said that she wanted to be a nurse. Mm -hmm. But her mother wanted her to be a teacher. That's right. So she became a teacher. But. God knows what she wants with everybody. So she ended up nursing all, all of us. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting. Nursing uh, her mother till she died, nursing her two sisters and mm, all the rest. Mm. That, that's how the world is. A true nurse, Florence yeah, Nightingale. A true nurse. Mm. Prof, you're credited with the creation of the Blue Book, Ghana's big, big, big picture of local governance. These days, when you sit down and look back after 26 years or 26 years on, what do you see? I remember that when the whole conversation about Article 241 uh, and then Article 55.3, whether to appoint or elect MMDCs to vote for them on political party lines, you had, together with your compatriots, written a very interesting read for the chairman of the NDC, of Zompofu, to read out, which, in fact, days after had that proposal by the president, Rajali Mahama, who was minister for local governance, withdrawn. When you look back now at what you created, what's being practiced now, what would you say? First of all, a little correction. I did not create the blue book. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, Chairman Rollins at the time put together a team of 29 mm -hmm. political activists camped at, at uh, the VRA facilities at Akuse. Okay. So the group became known as the Akuse group. Mm. And it was that group that developed what the media, it was the media that gave it the name, the Blue Book. Okay. But the actual name of the book was District Political Authority and Modalities for District Level Elections. Mm. That was him. But the cover was blue. So the <laughs> media, the media. <laughs> we gave it the Blue Book. They gave it the name, the, the mm. Blue Book. So it was after that proposal had been put together, that Chairman Rollins then called me and said, Look, and after the proposal had been put together, put together, 
I went around with late Justice D.F. Annan mm -hmm. to get the buy-in of Ghanaians by touring all the regions with the book. Okay. And then when we finished that exercise, President Chairman Rollins called me and said, look, the way I had been able to market the blue book, he thought I was the best person to implement the contents. Right. So then he appointed me PNDC Secretary for Local Government. Mm -hmm. And it became my responsibility to implement mm. the proposals in the blue book. So I didn't create it, but I was responsible for mm. the implement, okay. impl implementation. implementation. Um, now, you ask about the DCs, their election, etc., mm. and the abortive refer referendum. Right. Now, the problem with that referendum was that it was deliberately confused with the issue of election of MMDCs. The NDC, and for that matter myself, we have always been in favor of the election of MMDCs, but not on partisan lines. Okay. Now, Article 55, which you mentioned, mm -hmm. deals with making district assemblies partisan. That's right. That way mm -hmm. you require mm -hmm. a referendum That's because right. it is an, an entrenched, entrenched provision. Clause, yeah. So we could have had a referendum on that without reference to election of DCs. Which is 241. Article, uh, election of DCs is handled by 241. Article 241. It is not an entrenched provision. All right. All you need is two thirds of parliament to vote for DCs to be elected. But we wanted the election to be conducted on non partisan lines because the assemblies themselves were non partisan. Well, the president insists that it's already happening, even though it's not being properly couched, but it's already happening. When you go, you know an assemblyman who is yes. NDC aligned, NPP aligned. So? Yes, it's happening. But what is the effect? You see, our position which the party adopted was this. I want that we should not have a Brexit type of a referendum because the people of Great Britain, they went and voted to leave the EU before they started thinking about the consequences and the implications. They still haven't been able to live out of it. So I, our position was, let us agree on all the consequential matters. For example, I'll give you just two examples. Right. The Constitution says that the president appoints 30% uh, of the, the local, assembly members. Yeah, assembly members yeah. It doesn't create any problem now because the assemblies are nonpartisan. If you make the assemblies partisan mm. and you don't do anything about that provision, it means the president's party will contest the elections, win a certain number of seats, and then he will go and add 30% of his own people. Now, would that be democratic? So if we are going into partisan uh, local government, mm. we must agree to repeal that provision in the in the in the in the in the in the, in the constitution. Okay. That's well, I said two things. Yes. Another is mm. the assemblies are non-partisan now. The district assembly look, unit committee elections are therefore free. It's all state sponsored. Nobody pays anything. Now, if we make the assemblies partisan. Are the political parties going to be responsible for the payment of deposits, campaign expenses, etc., etc.? Mm. A party in government may very easily be able to do that. Mm. Will a party in opposition be very easily able to do that? Mm. So that provision that says that all district assembly elections and unit committee elections are free, we must agree before we go to a referendum I see. Okay. whether when they are made partisan, mm. the state is going to continue paying, sponsoring the assembly elections, mm. or the parties will take responsibility. Mm. Now, these are major consequences and implications of that decision, mm. which we had not addressed. And we were asking the president and his party to let us discuss and agree on those matters before we go to the referendum. They would not agree. And that is why okay. we took the position that we did. Hmm. I, I, okay, uh, Chrissy. So the conversation again about the GIPC. In that GIPC Act is the fact that retail business must be reserved for the indigents. And I remember reading from the book that the likes of Nana Dodanko Kufuado, Mr. Ken Ofriata, Mr. Fred Owari, who today are in power, joined you on tours to sell Ghana together with Chairman Rollins or President Rollins at the time. If you look at the GIPC Act, what was put in there, and how it appears that our retail business is being taken away from our people, Again, what runs through your mind? 
just a correction. Uh, Akufuado was n never part of Rawlings's mm. uh, investment promotion right. uh, program, but the rest of the names you mentioned that they okay. were, and uh, it was deliberately, calculatedly done, because at that time we're not looking at party colours. Okay. Um, Rawlings was going to look for business for Ghana. And we looked at the leadership of the private sector. Mm. And whoever were the leaders of those private sectors, we roped them in. Mm. And also those who were doing well. So um, I can mention uh, Furata, I can mention Owari, right, I can Owari. mention uh, Tobi Afedi, right. I can mention Afedi, a whole yeah. lot of them uh, joined us uh, on these programs. Mm. Uh, but the <laughs> that, that clause that says our retail trade, in the market should be li left to Ghanaians. At that time, we thought was a necessary condition because mm -hmm. most of our businesses were actually traders right. or uh, manufacturers' representatives. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, a lot of the traders go out there to China, uh, other to India, mm -hmm. and bring their goods to come and sell in our markets. <coughs> These are no goods that have been produced in Ghana. Right. Again, it takes me back to what I said earlier. Mm -hmm. If we had our demand, our taste for made in Ghana goods, then the beauty would be that Ghanaian goods will be those that will be promoted by these uh, uh, traders that we are talking about. Right. I mean, if you go to Malaysia, uh, Indonesia, uh, Thailand, etc., mm. all the goods that you see in their shops are locally manufactured goods. And that's what we go to buy and bring and sell here. Right. And then we said after we brought those goods, we should not allow others to come and compete with us, the Nigerians and all. We'll keep on having this problem because we haven't solved the basic what, problem. What do we need to do? You talked about the factories. Yes. And I said you need a, a, a change in taste. You need to set up factories that will produce locally. And I will mention uh, Eku Juice. Mm. Eku Juice to me is one of the leading uh, factory that have been put up, right. but Eco Juice is facing supply problem, raw material problem. So the supply side is always the constraint for us. Even though the demand is there and the okay. market is searching for Eco Juice, mm -hmm. remember there's all this competition of fruit juices from uh, the, the Don Simons of the world, the mm -hmm. Perez and all that. Mm -hmm. Eco Juice is trying to break into that market, but it cannot sustain itself unless we look at the supply side of things. So I would encourage our traders mm. not to hammer that point about encouraging them to sell imported items, mm. imported items to the exclusion of others, but they must make concrete efforts to promote locally produced goods. Interesting. Yes. Uncle so the use of LPG and then the establishment of the cylinder manufacturing company, uh, we're also talking about free distribution of cylinders captured in the book. Achichiri stoves, Ahibenso, um, uh, Bost, establishment of Bost and all of that. Now we're talking about, uh, what do you call it, the cylinder recirculation program, which looks like it has stalled because now the reality <coughs> on the ground is that people go to the LPG stations and they ask, they can't buy the full 14 kg, they say give me 20 CDs, 10 CDs, like the motor riders go and buy fuel. <laughs> you had a master plan. This government has a master plan. The government before had a master plan. But why are we not getting it right? Why are, why are we not getting it right? We always have a, seem to have a plan, but it looks like the plan it doesn't fall in place when we need it the most. We are, we are not getting it right because we are not going back to basics. You see, there should be a reason why we have to introduce the LPG program. The deforestation in Ghana is quite acute. And in our time, we thought that we should be looking at how to solve the de deforestation problem because the desertification was coming down. Mm. The Sahara Desert was coming down. Mm. And so we had to plant trees and all the rest. Meanwhile, as we were planting the trees, people were cutting the trees down for production of charcoal. Mm. Right now, we are looking at a situation where people think that we, sh we should be able to just go out there and sell LPG. But no. 
We thought in our mm -hmm. days, mm -hmm. me and Wido Kumburube and Terezo Usu and the rest, we thought mm -hmm. that, look, mm -hmm. we needed a plant in Ghana to produce the cylinders. And we produce the cylinders here. The cylinder manufacturing plant is there now. Okay. And what we did was we produced a 14.5 kg cylinder and then we also produced a uh, 5 kg cylinder. And the 5 kg cylinder, we call it Achidia, that mm. is tortoise, mm. because it was carrying its own, its own house. We put a gas thing mm. on top right. so you could cook on the cylinder mm. because of the gas thing, the cooker which had been put right. on top of it. Right. And that's why I'm saying that mm -hmm. we, you have to look at the philosophy behind what everybody is doing. Okay. If you think that you want the people to benefit from a program, you, first thing you ask yourself is, can they afford it? We knew at that time that the Ghanaians could not move from charcoal and firewood to LPG, okay. which is being sold. So the first thing we did was to say, Look, cylinders are free. You don't have to pay for it. But then somebody must pay for it. And, who, and whose bill was that? The bill was being footed by all of us. We calculated that every household will use about six cylinders of LPG every year. So if you are using six cylinders of LPG every year, we looked at the price of the LPG divided it by six and added it onto the price of the LPG. I see. So all of us were paying for it without us knowing that we were paying for the, LP, for the cylinder. Mm. And people were mm. very happy because Ghanaians we like free. Mm. And this one was free. But, but again, we are planting trees. Uh, last year we planted five million, seven million trees at a cost of 12 million cities. This year we have estimated to plant 20 million trees. But in the mix there's Achimota Forest, there's the Sakumono Ramsa sites, the conversations, one step forward, three steps backwards. Is that what you see as well? Are you, are you serious about that question? I am very serious. <laughs> <laughs> I to talk about... Microphone, please. And, and you mentioned it. Right. Every government that has come has the master plan. Right. Okay. So the master plan, he's saying, let's stop the certification. Mm. Let, let's let's reforest that thing. Let's use gas because Ghana was about to find gas, mm -hmm. and we're also hoping for Nigerian gas. Atuabo gas was coming on stream. Right. So what they did was to supply all secondary schools mm -hmm. with uh, gas stoves mm -hmm. to to convert them from using charcoal and and right. and firewood. So if you went to all those schools, they were using gas, and police right? And police, all the institutions were right. using gas. This was a clear policy, addressing the totality of the issue. Unfortunately, that gas, and, and at that time, gas was the cheapest among the uh, uh, fuel pricing, uh, petrol, uh, diesel, and gas. Gas was the cheapest, so everybody could afford it. And indeed, when you went to rural Ghana, you could see people moving into gas right. and stopping. But where we are today, uh, the gas project has virtually died because gas is very expensive. And, and therefore, all the trucks that you meet from... Uh, a chairman from a front place right, coming right. loaded with charcoal. Mm. They've gone and cut all the trees there and turned them into charcoal. During our time, Kuku evacuation, Kuku days, the Wenchi Bronhaf area, when Kuku moved from Ashanti region to Bronhaf, all those areas were Kuku growing areas. Right. Now the Kuku industry doesn't exist there anymore. Instead, the desert has taken <coughs> over. So these policies not only must be continued, but they must be sustained. Mm. Unfortunately for this country, Governments come and they decide to do, uh, move away from clear-cut, laid-down policy that okay. would save mm. in near to the benefit of this country. That, we're we're wrapping up the conversation a bit. I'll come to the ladies, uh, and please for, pardon me, indulge me a bit. Uh, Uncle, uh, Prof, let me come to you. So in 2017, page 375 of the book, you had bemoaned the situation where, at the inception of the new government, removal of the heads of the state-owned enterprise that happened, the board had been dissolved, councils, uh, removal of heads of security agencies, and you thought that it was quite unfortunate. Looking back, our state-owned enterprises continue to declare losses. In fact, the 2020 Auditor General's report mentions that our SOEs lost 5.3 billion. 
Ghana cities. The year before we lost some money, the year before, I'm sure in 2021 when the report is done, we'll see as well. Why do we keep going back and forth when in fact we could be sustainable? Uh, you bemoaned, but uh, again, it's still continuing, unabated. Well, I didn't just bemoan it. I also thought it was unconstitutional. And so we actually got somebody to take the matter to the Supreme Court. You know, the case is called Donko against the public, right. against the Attorney General. Right. It's reported in the, I think, 2020 or so Ghana law report. Mm. It took the Supreme Court three years to decide. And they decided that what the MPP government had done was unconstitutional. But by that time, they had sacked all the people who were at post and they had brought in new, uh, new people. Mm. But the effect of that judgment is that when the next government comes mm. and they attempt to do what they did in 2017, they will be told that there's a Supreme Court decision. But how did that, that hurt us as a country? Oh, I think mm. it did because, you know, um, you must remove heads of institutions for proven incompetence mm. or corruption or inability to perform. You don't remove them simply because the government has changed. You know? Of course, you can look for the incompetent ones or the corrupt ones. Mm. You, must, you, must, you must remove people from office for good reason. I see. But you don't remove them simply because the government has changed. Mm. Because you are just then replacing you know, one set of Ghanaian public officers with another set of Ghanaian public officers. And for me, it doesn't allow for the kind of continuity mm. that is designed to ensure productivity and profitability. A again, you wrote to Nana Dodanko Kufuado on the 18th of May. 2018, yes. about a question of uh, double salaries. Yes. Have you heard from the president? Yes, he, he replied. His, his sec I got a reply from his secretary that uh, my concerns had been uh, referred to the agencies who were conducting the investigations. And then? And then I didn't hear anything more. And uh, the Hula Baloo also appears to have died. Um, the people were threatened with uh, prosecution. Mm. I have not heard that any of them has been prosecuted yet. Mm. Um, and, and, you know, in that letter, I pointed out that the, the problem is systemic and structural and that it occurred when President Mills took over from President Kufo. Mm. What he did was to get an audit prepared and then get, because it was not the fault of the people who were paid. Mm. It is a system that makes it possible for people to be overpaid, you know, especially MPs who are also ministers. Because one set of people uh, paid by the controller and accountant general, the other set of people, the ministers are paid by controller, mm -hmm. the MPs are paid by parliament itself. Mm -hmm. So you have a situation where parliament pays an MP, and then the, because that MP is a minister, he is also paid by the controller and accountant general's department. Okay. So, and, and we thought that's, that structure in overlap, okay. imbalance, must be addressed. Be addressed. Okay. Don't, you don't address it by prosecuting people who are actually victims of a structure deficiency. I hear you. Let's wrap up. I'll start with you, last baby. Your closing thoughts as we get ready for 14th of June, uh, 2022, the big launch at the Ghana Academy of Arts and Sciences. Your closing thoughts on the book and the conversation. We're wrapping up. Wrapping up. I want Ghanaians to know that we are a very close-knit family and we took time and talked to each other and came up with this book mm. and our mother was actually the main focus, D13, which is where we grew up. It's all in the book and so people should take time and mm. look at it. Mm and know the character of Isin Kwanji, who is our mother. Right. And um, she encouraged accountability and um, thoughtfulness. So I would encourage people to get the book. Thank you. Yes, madam. I would want to say that um, this book has come up to at least um, make a lot of people know the Please truth. The make a lot of people know the truth about who the Ahoys are. Mm. Because many a times, so many stories are being 
told about the Ahoys mm. by people who do not even know who the Ahoys you are. You are kingmakers, <laughs> you are dangerous people, you hijack Ghana, <laughs> all of those ones. Yes, and um, the, the youth of today will buy what they hear. So for the book to be launched and to be sold for everybody to get hold of, I think we'll go a long way to mm. explain some of the issues that uh, people are battling uh, with. Right. Especially mm. when it comes to the political arena, and especially in our constituency, mm -hmm. Aguna East, where a lot are being said about the Ahoys, mm. that they have done nothing for their constituency, right. and so the youth are buying into it mm. and making it look as if the Ahoys have <coughs> gotten themselves out of their constituency. Mm. You, you tried to be MP, Uncle Kwesi, as well. Yes. It didn't work. It didn't work because of the, the, the tales that are being told uh, by politicians who are sort of trying to compete with the, with the constituency. And it's, so with this book, people mm. will get to know the truth about because Accusing the Ahoys of not doing anything for their constituency doesn't hold water. None of the Ahoys have become an MP in the constituency before. Mm. You see, almost all the three brothers have been ministers. Mm. But to become a minister, you are accountable to the whole country, not just your constituency. And so therefore, what they, should, what they did for their constituency, they mm. did it not just because of, it's their constituents, but they did it because it's for the whole country. Right. But uh, with this book mm. coming up and being launched on the 14th, mm. I think my constituency people would get to know us better. I we see. are a very, very loving I hear you. group of people. I hear you. I tell you. Ma, do you also feel the same way? I, yes, I feel the same way. You know, if you, if you get the book and you read it, you know that the Ahoys and the Dujan fish were not born with silver spoons in our mouths. We went through a lot. Right. From nothingness to where we are now. Because uh, we, we, God gifted us with, I would say, with brains. That's right. So we all studied very hard mm. and we got to where we are now. So I'll, I'll encourage the youth especially not to look at money first mm. you know but look at schooling a lot of people go to school now just for the sake of going to school because mm. they know that they will get free money somewhere that's right you know we sold we sold everything under the sun to help our mother mm. bring us up where we are so i'll encourage the youth to also learn <laughs> school and come up you know, as people mm. who will benefit the country. Thank you. Uncle Atu. <coughs> yeah. This book is a story about how... Jo John, my namesake. <laughs> 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 this book is a story about how from nothingness you can get somewhere. Right. And we were lucky that we all were born during the Nkrumah era or just before, the, uh, just before or after, or during the Nkrumah era. Mm. And in Nkrumah's, in Nkrumah's time, once you pass the common entrance, you didn't have to go and see anybody. You'd be staying home, then they'll bring you a letter that you've been admitted mm. to Kwembe College. Nanasi Embra. <laughs> <laughs> the Nanasi Embra <laughs> symbol. <laughs> you see, we, so, it is a book which tells single mothers, single fathers, single sisters that you may have a child <coughs> without support from one parent, but your children can make it if you apply yourself diligently. Mm. And as my sister was saying, they sold everything from dross to money mm. to everything. I hope you know dross. Yes, sir. Uh, <laughs> th those days, our mother was selling, was sewing drawers. We didn't have the, mm. um, the, the panties, the Max and Spencer mm. and uh, mm. all those things which are now being bought in the shop. Right. We all had to wear the 
CD cloth we right, brought. Right. And we sold those things with happiness. Because we knew that that was how we were going to survive. And I would appeal to single mothers and single fathers that they should take a leaf from this book and try and apply themselves. I know that times are different now. If even you pass the exam, you must know somebody who knows somebody who knows somebody before you can be admitted into a school. Yes, sir. Let us all apply ourselves mm. diligently and see where we can go. As I see those boys and girls marketing apples and those things on the streets of Accra, I feel sad for them because I've been through that. Right. But ours was not apples and grapes and the rest. Ours was a more Both fruit, banana. Both fruit, kerosene, <coughs> bros, and the rest. Those locally manufactured items. See. Thank you very much. Uncle Kwesi, you are, most people do not know, but having read this book, I saw in it that that famous diplomatic handshake at the second swearing in of President Rawlings in 1997 was engineered by you and Ambassador Sampi Ali. So he calls you Atu Kissinger. And most people, Kissinger. Kwesi Kissinger, sorry. But people don't know that. But I'm sure if they find this book, they'll get a lot more. Yeah. Looking back to uh, that moment where you felt so much tension at the Black Star Square, you had to engineer that with Ambassador Sampi Ali to get Tempest to cool down and for na the nation to stand together. What's running through your <coughs> mind again as we wrap up? At that time. Yes. I think that, that, that story should be told by President Kufo. Right. And he tells me that he, when he writes his book, and his book is in the orphan, this story will be in there. In fact, I'm going to see him to let give him a copy of the book. Right. Because it tells exactly what happened. Mm. Uh, Rawlings had won the election, and uh, MPP totally disagreed about that win, and they decided not to collaborate. So they asked their leader, mm. uh, Jay Kufo, not to attend uh, the, the swearing in ceremony, Baku four came, and so did other uh, opposition leaders, Mahama, Asuma, Banda, right, they right. were all there. And, but there was tension in the air. Ie Mahama, not... Ie Mahama. Mm. Uh, Edward Ie Nasigre Mahama. Mahama. PNC. Yeah, PNC, PNC. Dr. Mahama. There was tension in the air, and mm. Ghanaians were looking for uh, coolness. Right. So I, I, I had been, nationalistic as I am, I, I had been in, seized by that. And then fortunately, Sampi also was feeling the same thing. So he dropped this note to me that uh, it would be great if uh, Jay Kufo went and recognized uh, Rawlings. And so I, I took that note and uh, re-edited it. And I said, OK, President, I call him Senior. Senior, uh, this is the moment Ghanaians are waiting mm. for. Mm. Stand out of your group. Be your gentle self. Please go and recognize Rawlings. Mm. He asked me how that could be done. I said, if you give me the go ahead, I'll fix it. So he gave me the go ahead. I went to Rawlings on the stage and uh, told him Kufuo is ready to come and recognize him. He didn't right. believe it, right. but he said, okay, go and organize it. Uh, get Blavo involved, so mm -hmm. I did. And at the end of the day, when Abacha left, and that was the arrangement, uh, Rawlings right. worked with right. me that uh, we must let Abacha go. Mm -hmm. Then when he goes, mm -hmm. I bring Kufuo and his team through uh, uh, Blavo to come. So exactly that's what happened. Okay. And, and that was the big handshake the next day when mm. the newspapers <coughs> picked it up. Don't, don't, don't give away everything. They have to buy the book and come for the launch as well. Thank so, you. So don't give Thank away you. everything. Thank you. I was going to say... I had the privilege of reading it. So I was going to say, this book talks about virtually every Ghanaian. Mm. My siblings here have talked about the street hawkers. Right. How with they would buy this book. They should find <laughs> money to buy this book because they will see themselves in this book. Right. Asante Hine is in this book. That's right. Jay Kufo is in this That's book. That's right. John Mahama is in this former, book. Former IGP. Former uh, IGP are in Elizabeth, there. Uh, All the technical Robert people in of investment book. center, export promotion, mm. they are in this Cecilia book. Cecilia Dapa is in this book. Exactly. Yeah. Everybody has a role to play. Mm. And I want them to buy this book so they will see the leadership that we offer, right. the, ex the example that we give to mm. Ghanaians as a brotherhood that closely knit. But let me conclude by saying it is that close knit training that our mother gave us mm. 
that has kept us out of all the political vicissitudes okay. that this country has found itself. Right. Thank you. Nanado is in this book as well. Did you know he was a member of the National Association of Socialist Students Organization? Right. You didn't yeah. know. Go and read the book. Right. <laughs> well, Prof, let me, let me wrap up with you. You are skipping somebody. Yeah, I will. I'll come to her because you said she's your mother. I'll come to her. So, <laughs> see, the office of the regulator of political parties was a proposal that you had made. In wrapping up, it is not in place. We are going towards 2024. What do you say? Well, I'm hoping that it will be in place um, because remember, Nana Tudazi and I took this proposal, which was contained in the electoral reforms position paper that we developed for the NDC. Mm. You know, all the organizations that we met, we met, including the National Peace Council, the chiefs, etc., they all thought it was a wonderful idea. Um, let me give you just one reason. Yeah, quickly. Now, it is because the Electoral Commission is currently responsible for both the regulation of political parties and the conduct of elections that it is able to say that parties that are even non-existent mm -hmm. should become members of the IPAC, the Inter-Party Advisory Committee, right. and create all the tension and the confusion that has kept the NDC out of the, in, out, out of the IPAC. So if you have an, a, a, a body managing political parties, issues like the funding of political parties, mm -hmm. ensuring that political parties comply with the political parties act mm. you know that they have the requisite number of offices in the constituencies and the regions etc etc all of these accountability of political parties right now there's a requirement that at the end of every election uh, pol fully political parties should, yes to submit fully audited accounts right. to the electoral commission right. mm. have you ever heard the electoral commission make even one pronouncement on accounts and what they have found. It's because they are too busy, they conduct of elections, and it's not only presidential and parliamentary elections, they conduct district assembly elections, unit committee elections, elections by all kinds of bodies, professional mm -hmm. associations, etc. So their hands are always very full. So for them, mm -hmm. this one is tangential. So let us split the two. Many, many countries in our research, we found that the vast majority of countries have two separate bodies responsible for managing, regulating mm. political mm. parties and conducting and, and that's what Ghana needs. That's what Ghana needs. Great. Mama of the house, <laughs> you have the final word. My final word is for siblings to learn from our book the closeness that has brought us this far. Mm. And then just to know that when, when I come out, among the siblings at the best. I don't have to leave the rest behind. And thanks to our big brother, mm. he, he is our father figure and he has been our father figure all around. When he came out, mm. he held our hands mm. and we also held the hands of the others. And that's how, that's how far we have right. come. Thank you, yes. thank you very much. Chamamao, we have to go. Thank you, as the eldest thank and as the one who's not a chief vandal, but was very influential at Commonwealth Hall back in the day, <laughs> and was part of all the aluta uh, back in the day as well, and enjoyed free meals morning, afternoon, evening with lunch <laughs> at the time, snack, snack, snack at the time, snack, yes, snack snack at snack, four yes, a cup on po at the time, the dinner and all of that. Is it your view, finally, is it your view that students in this country as vocal as you were back in the day on issues of germane concern to them, one. And two, the question about children going to school and the school feeding program not being activeness. I want your thoughts on that. Um, I would say that right now, students at the tertiary institutions are not the type of students that we were in our days. Because now, the political parties have infiltrated the universities and they elect the, they help to elect the leaders mm. of the political parties. Mm. All right. Go ahead, please. So it's no longer, I, I, I wouldn't say that it, it, it is the sort of thing that we 
were doing when we were in power, mm. when we were in school. But now it is totally different. And unfortunately for us, it is even going down to the secondary school where the students are being disorganized by political parties. And therefore, they cannot speak their mind, mm. they cannot teach their, their counterparts or, mm. or their peers right. what politics is actually about. Mm. I remember I, I was asking my daughter whether she's heard of um, Franz Fanon. She's never heard of Franz Fanon. She hasn't read anything about Karl Marx. She hasn't read any of those books. Mm. But then in that days, we formed groups to read these great politi political articles and books. And we were happy in discussing them. We had political groups to discuss these things. Right. But that's not what is happening. Thank now. you very much indeed. So you've been listening to the children of house number D13, South Sun Treso, PO Box 3616, Edum Kumasi. And they've been sharing their life stories with us and telling us what exactly uh, their growing up partner has been like septuagenarians, sexagenarians, and quinquagenarians who have shared their stories with us. Their hoist and their dujen fee. The book launch is on the 14th of June, 2022, 3 p.m. sharp at the Ghana Academy of Arts and Sciences. Thank you very much for watching. My name is John Hughes. There's more on New Day.